Barbara Ellen Diggs, and I'm a craftsperson here in Decatur. And today I'm here to speak with you on the critical importance of crafts in our culture. Today I exhibit my work statewide, and I have invented over 512 different sellables for Christmas bazaars. And last Christmas, across a particularly memorable sweatshirt, I created an entire colonial village, including an ice skating pond, a blacksmith shop, and a mischievous Jewish peddler. <laughs> well, my family's always been very supportive of my hobbies, except for my son, whom I loved dearly. I also deeply enjoy scrapbooking. My mom and my sister are both very crafty people, so subsequently I have been dragged to a number of craft shows over the years. The people that run booths at these things are strikingly confident and passionate, but very emotionally reserved. For our main character, Barbara Ellen, the death of her son forces her out of this typical hard outer shell, and for a while, even keeps her from doing what she loves, crafting. But over the course of this speech, Barbara Ellen learns that the loss of a child doesn't have to keep you from doing what you love. It can actually make you strong again. If a huge quilt and a giant French craft project can help a nation start to heal after the devastation of 9-11, then maybe a little bit of hot glue is all it's gonna take for her to put her own broken heart back together. Crafty by Paul Rudd. You know, some sophisticated people say that crafts are art. But by that same token, some people say that New Yorkers are people. <laughs> crafts allow me to express myself, to create something worth uh, dusting. For example, I color Xerox a simple Polaroid of my Aunt Polly, and I place the image at the center of a piece of oak tag. From there, I surrounded the image with heart-shaped lace doilies and silk ribbon, work to spell out, Aunt Polly. I also included some ticket stubs from a movie we saw together, the invitation to her wedding, and a tiny burlap bag containing one of her kidney stones. <laughs> the page now weighs over 15 pounds. And it can tell you Aunt Polly's entire life story. And I don't even like her. <laughs> My son Hank was always very uh, special. He used to scold me for using words like that. What did he call them? Uh, euphemisms. He'd say, Mom, I'm gay. And I'd say, No, you're not. You're special. <laughs> bothered me, even though he did move so far away. He started working for a fancy Broadway costume designer in New York, and uh, he didn't come home all that often. But we would write back and forth, and he'd send me these trims and braids from the costumes, and I didn't know what to do with them. But to thank him, I would send him Hubble bikinis. <laughs> you know, those cute little ceramic children holding an umbrella or petting a kitten or sitting on a swing. <laughs> and he would get so mad. On the phone, he'd say, Mom, don't send anything you can order from TV. <laughs> Which really upset me. So to express that, I sent him a humble, sad little clown. <laughs> Bunny 
hands on his sled. Picture frame covered with twine and plastic daisies. And I said, no. I know how all that just upsets you. Makes you feel like a hick. and he said, oh, that's okay, Mom. I just wanted to see you again. <coughs> I stayed there with him until, well, let's use one of those euphemisms until he passed on. You know, maybe that's why euphemisms got invented. Not because people are ashamed, but because they hate the real work too much. And I hated that work. And I hated that disease. And for the longest time, I just went to work, and I came home, and I didn't touch a thing. Not a needle, not a bobbin, not a hole punch or pair of pinking shears. I would not bring color or beauty or right back into this world. I was just...
when I finally got back to Decatur, <coughs> I felt cheerier for the first time in years. My friend Susan Deckerman says it's because I found closure. And I said, Susan, Oprah is just a person. <laughs> <laughs> I was a New Yorker. I would believe in iron shower. 